Amen. He is worthy, church. He is worthy. My name is Sean Lewis. I'm one of the staff pastors here. We are so glad that you are here. Hopefully everybody got a worship guide and a warm welcome as they walked in the doors. If you are new or a guest, this is the best resource to stay connected with everything going on here at Gilead. You'll find on one side kind of a list of events, and then inside you can find sermon notes uh, as well. If you're joining us online, welcome. Those sermon notes can be found in the video description or in the link right below the video. Two things I want to highlight real quickly. Number one is that the fall small group semester begins today. So we have a lot of groups, yep, a lot of groups available to you. Some some new groups, again, I would recommend everybody check the directory for all the groups that are available to you. Just a list of a few of them are going to be highlighted in this worship guide and on, on Gilead News, but there's so many groups that we have to offer to you. The way that you can find those is on our website, on the online directory, in the Church Center app, or there's a paper copy uh, of the directory at the Welcome Center. Secondly is that Gilead's annual Fall Fest is quickly approaching. I can't believe it's already September and we're talking about Fall Fest. Um, Time has just flown by. But there's going to be on Friday, October 1st. More details can be found uh, in the worship guide. But one thing that we ask of you every year is that we uh, have a candy donation uh, receptacle in the lobby. And if you guys wouldn't mind donating bagged candy, that would be great because we take that candy and we create uh, little candy bags for all the kids uh, that night. The one thing that we do ask is that they're sealed candy, not the, the twisted wrappers. So thank you in advance for your participation. We ask that you go, uh, register ahead of time because we're going to have food and we want to know how many to prepare for. So you can register at the Welcome Center or online on our website or on the Church Center app. We're so glad that you're here today. 
It is September, but at least it's, you know, uh, well, it's 73 now, but it's getting to get in the 80s today, I believe. So enjoy the warm weather while it lasts. But before we get to Gilead News, let's turn to our left, turn to our right, turn to the balcony. Let's wave and greet those around you today. Thanks for being here. Welcome to Gilead. My name is Christine and I serve with our Gilead worship team. Thanks for joining us today. We believe that God gave every one of us unique gifts and talents to fulfill the specific purpose he created us for. If you want to learn more about the gifts he's given you, make plans to join us today right after service in Victory Chapel for step two of the Gilead Growth Track. During step two, you will learn about the unique aspects of your God-given design through personality profile and spiritual gifts assessment to see how God specifically created you. The fall small group semester has begun. From men's groups to student groups, prayer groups, and activity groups, we have a group for you. Check out all the groups available to you on our website at gileadtaylor.com slash small groups on the Church Center app or pick up a copy of the directory today at the Welcome Center. And finally, as you walked into the service, you were handed a worship guide with sermon notes, a prayer list, and other important information about what's happening at Gilead. Also, in the pew in front of you, you'll find a connection card. If you are a guest, we hope you will take a moment to fill it out so we can connect with you and send you some more information about our church. We would also like to encourage everyone to take advantage of the prayer request section at the bottom of the connection card so we know how we can pray for you. These prayer requests are prayed for weekly by our prayer team. Just drop it in the offering bucket as you exit at the end of the service or at the Welcome Center located in the lobby. You can also fill out a digital connection card by scanning the QR code on the back of your worship guide or on screen. For more information and to see everything going on here at Gilead, please refer to your worship guide or visit gileadtaylor.com. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We will see you next week.
Well, good morning, church. Every once in a while, Craig just has to get that out or he'll explode. And uh, thank you, worship team. They do an awesome job, don't they? And uh, those of you that are joining online, come on, church, let's give them a big welcome for going along for the ride journey today as we uh, uh, actually look at the last of the series, Book of Prayers. Before we get into that, just a few uh, things. I, I'm, I'm glad you listened to the messages, and I know that you do. As I was shaking hands and greeting people today, I was giving this what looks to be a pen, and, and one side actually is. You can write with that side. And, but the other side is a, a flathead and a Phillips screwdriver in case the next time I get trapped in a bathroom. <laughs> so you do listen. Thank you. I don't know if it would have helped that day or not, but the thought... Cindy Stafford, you know who you are. <laughs> and uh, I, I think she was just as listening to the story and going, I'm so glad it was Pastor Tom trapped in there and not me. <laughs> so uh, also today as I was shaking hands, Edith uh, informed me that she's going to be moving out of state to be closer to her kids. Edith, we loved our time with you and we're going to miss you. Stand up, Edith. <laughs> And uh, we're going to miss you, but uh, stay connected online, and uh, I, it's hard to leave a place that you've found as a home, and, uh, and you're going to survive this, and uh, if your kids are mean to you, just come on back. Uh, we promise not to be. Um, it's, it's been a great series, uh, uh, and yesterday was a very uh, somber day. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we memorialized yesterday uh, an attack uh, against our nation and, and our people. And thousands of innocent people lost their lives that day. But several hundred first responders also gave their lives that day uh, running to the trouble instead of away. And one of the things that I was reminded of as I was looking at things yesterday was one of the numbers, I, I, I'm a numbers person, you know that, one of the numbers I'd forgotten about because those first responders ran to the trouble, over twenty to 25,000 people were rescued out of those two towers after the planes hit after. And the Bible says, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life uh, for another. And those first responders laid down their lives so others could live. And uh, that's what makes America special. Yeah. And we didn't just come up with that. We didn't just say, you know, we're going to be a different country where we lay down our lives for others. No, the reason America has that spirit is because our country was founded on what God did for us. Yeah. So when we were in trouble with our sin and its debt, which was judgment and condemnation, God sent his son into the trouble. And he laid down his life to rescue mankind. And, I, and man threw his worst at Jesus. And out of that brutality came the grace and mercy of God. Amen? So the, the most beautiful picture of who God is came out of that tragedy of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I think... 20 years ago, you saw the beauty of America and its spirit come out during that tragedy. Amen? Amen. Amen. I think you also saw that spirit come out last winter when we were thrown, I think, a, a weapon of some sort called COVID-19. 
And the first responders this time were the people on the front lines of hospitals and, and care facilities, and we want to honor them as well. Thank you. And they're under a lot of pressure right now, and we love you, and we uh, are with you. We have done a series um, called The Book of Prayers because the Bible is a book full of prayers. And uh, you're, you're noticing them now, I think, because of this series. And we did this, and, and we ended our 21 days of prayer, but prayer did not end yesterday. Amen? Uh, we did this series to just give fresh life to our prayer life because a lot of Christians, and I'm one of them, I struggle with uh, praying because I, I feel like, okay, I, I want to make sure I do this right and I don't want to mess up, and sometimes I do it out of discipline more than delight, I'll admit to you, because I, well, I'm supposed to be praying, so I'm going to pray. And, and what hopefully we learned in this, what I was trying to get across is that we can actually enjoy prayer, uh, that it's, some, it's a tool that God gave us uh, to enrich our life, not to make our life more difficult. So we looked at our key verse for the whole thing was Ephesians 6.18, where it said, pray in the Spirit in every situation. And we learned in this series that sometimes, you know, praying a many times, like a minute or, or a half a minute during the day sometimes is better than trying to add them all up and shove them into one, either at the beginning or the end of the day or both, just to be in a constant mindset of connecting with God all day long. And then Paul writes, use every kind of prayer and request there is. So there's different types of prayer, different models, uh, different, if you will, formulas, patterns, if you will, of prayer. And we've learned a couple of them. We, we learned the prayer of the tabernacle or Moses' prayer, how that they would approach God uh, in the tabernacle and also in the temple. Then the prayer of Jabez was a, was a great pattern of prayer to, to pray for God's blessing and influence and protection and, and to, to make a difference. And then last week, didn't Pastor Sean do an awesome job with the New Testament prayer? And, and thank you, Pastor Sean, for that. We enjoyed watching it uh, online uh, with you. So we, we, we watched right while you guys uh, were doing it here. Today we're going to look at the prayer of the sheep because I want to begin with the theme, uh, asking a question. And, and let's just be honest, and you don't have to say it out loud, but think about this for a moment. Why should God answer our prayers? When we pray to him, why should he answer our prayers? And if you think about it for a moment, you might say, well, uh, you know, I've, I've done my best this week and really tried this week. You know, some weeks I don't try this week. I really tried. Or maybe, oh, I repented. I got right with him, so he needs a... He needs a prayer or, or some kind of answer like that based upon me, uh, but he doesn't answer prayer based upon me. Now, hopefully that doesn't disturb you. Hopefully it unleashes a burden from off of you. It sets you free because if God answers prayer based on me, then the onus is on me to pray a certain way, and I think this is why many people find prayer difficult. It's, it, then the, the pressure's on me to deliver the kind of prayer and to deliver that prayer in the kind of mindset, in the kind of spiritual condition where God can see fit to answer. But I just want to take the pressure off. He doesn't answer prayers because of me and you. He answers prayer because of who he is. He has a prayer because of who he is. Thankfully, thankfully. So the pressure's off, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And so when you look in the Bible, and, and now you're recognizing the prayers, you, you don't see people praying in the Bible, oh God, this is who I am, and this is who who, what I've done, and this is where I'm at at this. No. You see, prayers say, oh, God, 
This is who you are. This is what you've done. This is what I've seen you do. It's based upon who he is. Oh, God, you were this. You've done that. I can run to you for safety because of who you are. It's based upon who God is. That's why the third command of the Big Ten is do not take the name of the Lord God in vain. And that doesn't mean uh, not swearing, or if you're from the South, not cussing. Although it, that's probably not a good practice either, but that, that's not what taking the Lord's name in vain means. What that means is that there is a power and authority to the name of God and the names of God, and we should not try to use those names in an unworthy way, is what that actually means. Because the name of God has power and authority to it. When the disciples came to Jesus, one of the prayers that we didn't study, but you know this prayer, they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, we want to pray like you pray. How do we do this? And so we famously call it the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. We should call it the disciples' prayer. Because the Lord taught the disciples, well, this is how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus himself in saying, this is how I would pray. I recognize the name of my Father in heaven. First and foremost, who he is in prayer. Paul continues this thought in Philippians 2.9. He says, for this reason, God has highly exalted Jesus after his death, burial, and resurrection, and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue. There's going to be a day where every single created being in the history whether it be humans or the angels that fell with Satan, they're all going to bow before the name of Jesus and confess with their lips that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so I want to look today at the Bible includes eight covenant names of God because the name of God has authority it has power and we he answers our prayers based on who he is and so the Bible gives us eight covenant names names that he promises to be and all eight of their those names are found in a passage of scripture that you just might be familiar with and you didn't know but you know, you'll know at the end of today that it contains all eight of those covenant names of God. And that is the famous Psalm 23, the Psalm of the Good Shepherd. So let's say it together, okay? It's going to be on the screen. And let's say it together. I will read it out loud, and you will read it out loud. I didn't say out quiet. <laughs> let's use our playground voices, okay, church? We're out in the playground. It's kindergarten. Let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Can I get a good amen? Amen. 
So there, in, contained in Psalm 23, are the eight covenant names of God. So let's go through these, because it really is going to tell us who God is and why, because of who he is, he answers our prayers. And the first is 23.1, the Lord is my shepherd. Lord, you are my shepherd. Notice it doesn't say a shepherd. Notice he doesn't say, well, he's, he's a shepherd for everybody. It says, no, he's my shepherd. Now, let me tell you, I don't know where you're from. I don't know your, everybody's story in minute detail, but your life is not going to make sense until Jesus is your personal shepherd. Until he's the one that is close to you. He's the one that you're allowing to guide you and lead you through life. You're going to feel like something's missing until Jesus, you can look at him and say, you're my shepherd. It's a personal relationship. And that's why the psalmist wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, for those of you that want to go deep, we're going to, I'm going to give you the Hebrew names, these eight covenant names, and this one is Jehovah Reah, R-A-A-H, but it's pronounced Reah. That's what it means. And the, the best English word I can give you for Jehovah Reah is this. The Lord is my pastor. The Lord is my pastor. That's the closest English word to this. They say, what is a pastor? Well, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm your pastor. And God made me for a certain task, and, and this is the task he made me for. And let me tell you, I love feeding you on Sunday. I, 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 I really believe that the messages will actually benefit your life, that if you just dig into them, I, and it gets me excited. If, if Cindy would talk publicly, which she like, does not want to do, and you're like, oh, you never let her talk. If I asked her to come up here and talk, we, there would be lawyers involved the next day. <laughs> She's like, that's your gift, it's not mine. Okay, so I, I'm not just squelching her. She's like, no, thank you very much. But it's, it's a gift and a heart that God has given. It's not mine. It's a gift from him to feed you, to, to lead you to the truth of God that will bring blessing to your life. And, and you know, Every week in a pastor's life, you get kicked a little and you get thrown because the sheep are like, you're like, come on, over, come over here. It's good over here. It's really good over here. Believe me. And, like, ah. <laughs> and they run over and the lions are over there and the bears and the tigers. Oh, my. I'm like, don't go over. No, no. And it, it breaks my heart. But every week, I really believe this is the week. It's going to click. It's going to all make sense. And life is actually going to change. I really believe that. If I didn't believe that, I'd quit doing this. But the best thing I can lead you to is the Word of God. The Word of God. Because that will guide you when I'm not there. It will sustain you when you're alone, it, when you feel powerless. It will be there in all the important moments of your life saying, this is the way to go. Yeah. As your shepherd, I want to protect you. I want to care for you. I, I, I want to feed you just like Jesus did for us, but in a much smaller way because I'm nowhere close to being Jesus. Well, think about that. Jesus came from heaven to this earth so he could shepherd us. He gave his life so we could have life. He wants to protect you. He wants to lead us. He, he wants to feed you. He wants to take care of all your needs because he's that kind of shepherd. Amen? And so that's why John writes Jesus in John 
recounts what Jesus said. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. And that's, that's one of the exciting things about church, I think, is because we come into this room, and, and people walk into this room, and, and they don't have that relationship with God, but they have the opportunity to enter into that relationship, to that shepherd relationship with the God that laid down his life for them. And they can walk out going, he's my shepherd now. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Amen, church? Amen. So he is our shepherd, Jehovah Reah. Secondly, he is also, as our shepherd, he is the one that provides for us. We can say that God is our provider. Psalm 23, 1b says, there is nothing I lack. There's nothing I lack. A lot of people, we fall into the trap of saying, well, it's up to me. If my life's going to be good, if I'm going to get ahead, or if I'm going to have financial security. If you were to define what financial security is, I think we'd all agree that financial security is having more than I have right now. Okay? We would all say that. Well, how, how much is it? I don't know how much it is, but it's more than I got. Okay? Do you know that the people that have more than you and I have, they feel just as financially insecure as we do because it's never enough. There is no way you can financially put yourself in a position where life can't touch you. Yeah. And make all that wealth and all that Security, meaningless, just like that. Just like that. And so that's why Jesus said, I'll provide for you. There's nothing that you lack. Our tendency is to want to provide for ourselves, And that is why I just find this amazing. And it's, it's a historic fact in America that the wealthy among Americans, and if you live in America, you're in the top 10% in the world. You're, you're a 10%er. You say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. Compared to the rest of the world, you're already in the top 10%. But the top 1% in America give far less percentage wise as poor people. Why? That's a good question. Why would the people that have so much give such a small percentage? Because the people that don't have much, they know I can trust in what I have, but it ain't going to do anything. The people that have a lot, they trust in what they have. So they can't let it go. That's why. But we let it go because I don't have enough to move the needle anyways. So I might as well obey God with it. Yeah. So this is the... Hebrew word Jehovah Jireh. And Paul says in Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And today, who, who would you want to be a child of? Would you want to be Warren Buffett's child? Would you want to be Bill Gates' kid? I don't know about that. Uh, would you want to be one of the Rothschild children? Or would you rather be the child, the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Who says, it's all mine. It's all mine. Amen? I thought I'd get a, a rousing applause on that. Okay? You're my provider. You're my shepherd. And third, you are my peace. I think the world needs Psalm 23, 2. He lets me to lie down in green pastures. Now, for a sheep, that's very peaceful. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now, it doesn't say that if you know the Lord, you will have peace. It says, no, he is peace. He is my peace. He will not provide peace. He is peace my peace. A lot of people, we, a lot of the stress is work-related stress or financially related stress or relationships cause stress or even health problems cause stress. 
And, and stress is a difficult thing in our life, but a lot of the reason we don't have peace is because we're just doing too much. Because you're like me, man, if one is good, two is better. That's right, that's right. If a dollar is good, two is better, right, right. If one piece of pizza is good, two is better. Right. If one wife is good, two is. No, it's wrong. It's wrong. Just wanted to make sure you're listening. Don't go there. Don't go there. You say, well, Solomon. It turned his heart away from God. Okay. But think about this. He is our Jehovah Shalom. He's our God of peace. It's that Jesus tells his disciples in John 14. Now think about the context. He's about to go to the cross and leave them. And he's telling them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. He says, my peace is not like the world's. And what's the world's peace? Well, it's moment by moment. He says, your heart must not be troubled or fearful, because why? His peace. So if we're so busy trying to get, trying to get and take care of ourselves like in the previous one, not trusting God as our, our, as our Jehovah Jireh, then he can't be our Jehovah Shalom, our peace, because why? Because our hands are full of stuff, and we don't have any ability to grab hold of him. Ecclesiastes writes this, better one handful with peace, with rest, than two handfuls with effort and a pursuit of the wind. So very clearly he says, man, trying to get that second handful can drive you away from having any peace in your life. Better to have, be content with one and have rest in your life than have two handfuls and you can't embrace God anymore because you're so full of stuff. He is our Jehovah Shalom, but he is also my healer. Verse 3 says, he renews or restores my soul. If you would take the word disease and break it into two words, it's dis-ease. Anything that is not at peace. Anything that is away from peace. I think most of our physical lack of peace, dis-ease, has to do from our emotional, our mental, our, our spiritual dis-ease. Not being at peace with God on the inside causes a lot of physical ailments to show on the outside. I know what they're saying about the numbers and COVID and all that. But let me tell you, still, what the number one killer in America is, stress-related illnesses, heart attacks, blood pressure, hypertension, because of a lack of peace. And man, God is the only one that can heal us on the inside. He's my healer. This is Jehovah Rapha. And the word there, he renews or restores, means he takes us back to what he originally intended. See, when, when our great-great-grandma and grandpa, Adam and Eve, when they fell in the garden, the enemy destroyed, and a curse was placed on us, and God sent his son Jesus to restore us back to and one day he's going to restore the whole world, the whole universe, back to its original condition. And that's what he wants to do in our life. He wants to take our soul back to its original condition. That's what it means when he redeems us. He not only purchases us, but he restores back to the original content, back to the original state that it was created in. Can I get an amen there? Amen. 
He takes us back to the place of departure. Peter writes, he personally, speaking of Christ, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and now live for what is right. By his wounds, we are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now we have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of our souls. He wants to put it all new again. Can I have an amen that God is Jehovah Rapha? But he is also, God, you are my righteousness. And I, I, as I, I was excited leading up to this about getting across to you how that it took so much pressure off of me when I realized that God doesn't answer my prayer based upon who I am because my righteousness and $5 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> Probably this time of year with some pumpkin spice something in it. <laughs> my righteousness will get you nothing. But his righteousness is perfect. It's perfect. He is the God of righteousness. He has no wrong in him. <laughs> He's perfect. He met the standard for us. And so when you and I stand before God in Christ, we're not standing in our righteousness, what we've done. We're standing in his righteousness and what he has done for us. And the righteousness of God, that's where we exist and move it says in psalm 23 he leads me along the right paths or the righteousness for his namesake now when i was young i thought that to live that right life to all you young people righteousness is boring sin is fun right the sinners mom and dad they have more fun okay that's what I thought, and the Bible agrees with you. It says, oh yeah, sin's fun for a little while. And then when the bill comes, it ain't fun no more. But if you, as a young person, want to live the real adventure, walk with God. He will take your life places you never Imagine possible. Never. You, on your own, I mean, think about it. Here's what the world says. Okay, you, you work hard, you get ahead so you can what? So you can party on the weekends. So you can have the finest liquor, or today, the best, the best buds, the best marijuana grown, because it's legal now. So you can smoke the best dope, not that skunky stuff that I smell in Southland Mall. <coughs> I'm like, man, they, I walk by, I'm like, get some good weed at least, you know? <laughs> it's horrible. I'm sorry. All right, that's not going to translate well. I am not encouraging anybody to get high. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not. But this, 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 this is what the world says. And you, and you get the nice house and the nice automobiles, and you get the nice buzzes, but buzzes are basically buzzes whether you're, you know, drinking Mad Dog 2020 or the finest wine from California. A buzz is a buzz. And you wake up in the morning... You don't feel too great. Your body has to recover. And you go, oh, man, I, I can't overdo it. And, it's, it and, and then you just repeat the cycle. And the world says, that's living high. That's living great. You know what that is? It's boring. It's the same thing every week. It's boring. You go with God, it's never going to be boring. Because he's going to throw curveballs. You're like, boy, I didn't see that coming. 
He's like, let's go here. He's going to test you. He's going to stretch you. He's going to grow you. You're going to become a person. I never saw myself being this person. He, all those things are possible with his righteousness. With his righteousness. And so the word here is Jehovah, and the T is silent. It's Sidkenu. Sidkenu. And it means righteousness. It's, it, Peter uses it in 1 Peter 1, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, thinking this is all that life has to offer, but as the one who called you is separated, is holy, is righteous, so also are we to be holy in all of our conduct. That's the proof text that our relationship with God is real when it's not drudgery, but it's exciting for us to be like, what's God have for us today? Let's follow him today. Why? Because his way is better than the world's way. His way is better than my way. Okay. Yeah. He's my righteousness. And number six, if we're going to walk on that separated way of righteousness, then we need somebody to walk with us, and he is our constant companion. Psalm 23, 4, even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. You're with me. His rod and staff comfort me. So David wrote, if I went to the pit of hell, he's there. If I live in a cave, he is there. If I live on the highest of the mountains, he is there. It, why? Because God is there. There is part of who he is. He's there. Where? He's there. He's not like one there. He's, he is there. You know what I'm saying? You can't get away from there. You figure that out? Why? Because he's there. The theological thing is called omnipresence in case. I'm not making it up. It's actually, why? What's omnipresent? He's there. Amen. Not in a place, no. The definition of there is it's God. Amen. You're never going to go a place he's not there. Amen. Amen. He's there. When you walk through that valley of death and your family can't go, he's there. He's there. When you open up your eyes in a new land, he's there. When you go through the most horrific things in this life, he's there. And all those people that were buried underneath those, the mounds of rubble 20 years ago, he was in there. Underneath there with those people. There's no place you can go away from him. He's there. Can I get an amen? amen? The word, Hebrew word is Jehovah Shema. In Hebrews it says, your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he, Jesus himself has said, I will never leave you. Or forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what man can do to me. Why? Because he's there. He's with us every step of the way. There's not a doctor's appointment you're going to alone, there's not a grief counselor you're sitting with alone. No. Nope. He's there. He's there. But he's also my defender. Remember, I was the youngest. And so uh, my sisters were, of course, way older. And they were teenagers when I was still a little rug rat. You know, and, and so I'd be playing a game and the girls would, you know, one of the sisters would be sent to where I was and say, hey, tell Tommy dinner's ready. And they'd come, hey. Tommy, dinner's ready. I'd still play, and they'd come back, and where's Tommy? Well, I told him. And remember this? 
Go tell them dad said dinner's ready. <laughs> and he'd say, hey, Tommy, dad said dinner's ready. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because my sisters didn't have that authority. But my daddy did. Everybody understand what that means? Yeah, yeah. Well, guess what? Your heavenly daddy, he's got all the authority. And so when there's trouble in your life and your enemies surround you, you know what he tells you? Sit down and grab a bite to eat. I got this. So, no, he didn't say that. Let's read it right from Scripture. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So when you're surrounded by your enemies thinking, man, life is just going to collapse, he says, sit down and have a sandwich, Tom. I'll take care of this. Because he is the authority over all my enemies. The Hebrew word here is Jehovah Nissi. It actually means banner of victory. So when your enemies surround you, he just walks into the room because he's right there with you with his bannery of victory and says, I've already defeated you, Satan. I've already defeated you, sin. I've already defeated you, sickness. I've already defeated you, grave. There's nothing you can do to hurt my child, so just sit down, take a seat. They're going to have a meal right now. Oh, I wish we could trust God like that. David said, man, when I'm surrounded by my enemies, he says, just sit down and have a meal. I got this. I will be your Jehovah Nissi. 2 Thessalonians 3 says, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. And let me just take a moment right here, because this afternoon we're going to go to lunch and we're uh, grow, hopefully some of you come to growth track because it's step two and learn how God has uniquely gifted you uh, to fulfill your call in life. Just like what I'm doing right now, this is not me. God gifted me for this. It's his, it's his doing, and he has gifted you for this, for something too. And you can discover what that is in growth track two, uh, step two today. And then many of you are going to go to lunch and you're, gonna, you're worried about, well, what are you going to eat? Or maybe you already have determined it's in, it's in the oven. You're hoping I don't go late. Okay? You had Pastor Sean this last week, okay? I'm back. <laughs> All right? So, and then the, the men's golf league, they're going to have a golf out and finish up the season. Uh, the church, we're going to play on Sunday and defy all the Sabbath rules right there. And we're going to do our best to not take the Lord's name in vain this afternoon. But all the while we're doing our thing, there are men and women all over this world called the U.S. military. And they are at the ready, and they're looking after you and me, and we're blissfully unaware but they're on duty, taking care of us so that we can be oblivious to what's really going on, the threats. And I thank God for the U.S. military. Yeah. Thank you. Come on, church. You can do better than that. Because some of them are watching right now from other parts of the world. And we appreciate you, and we love you, and you're being a human Jehovah Nissi to us. Thank you. Thank you. The last, God is my sanctifier. Psalm 23, 5, you anoint my head with oil. That's, an, that's a picture of God's anointing, the Holy Spirit anointing. But my cup overflows. He gives me more than I need. Anoint just actually means to be set apart. Sanctification doesn't mean, oh, never do anything. Sanctifi to be sanctified means to be set apart. So when they, for instance, when, they, when Moses and the art, art 
the craftsmen and artisans, they made all the necessary bowls and tools and, and tongs and everything they made for the tabernacle. They were just regular tongs. They were just regular bowls made out of silver, gold, brass, what have you, until they were anointed with oil and set apart only to be used for God. And then they said, don't take these utensils out of here. Don't use them for everyday life. They're only to be used for God. And when you trust him, when he becomes your shepherd, whether you realize it or not, at that moment, he sets you apart for himself. And the life that we get to live now is not our life anymore. It's a life lived for him. And he has anointed you and made you special. You see how he, and if you knew me when I was a young man, you would say, never will Tom Downs ever be able to do that. Well, how does he do that? It's an anointing of God, and you have one too. There isn't a person that has Jesus as their shepherd that hasn't been anointed by God for something special. He has gifted you. It comes easy to you. Other people are amazed and blessed by it. But he has set you apart. He has sanctified you and anointed you and given you more than you need in that area of life so you can be a blessing to others. He has. That's why we do the growth track. The word here is Jehovah Makadesh. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, but you, all of us, you can put your name right there. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart for his possession. Why? So that you may proclaim, so that out of our life, as we live in that anointing, we proclaim the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. How does the world know that what we say about Jesus is true when we live those sanctified lives? When we live set apart for God in that anointing, in that gift that God has given us, the world recognizes. They stand up and they go, that's different. That's different. That's when they say, how do you do that? And that's where the Bible says we are to give the praise to our Father. It's Him doing a work in me. Hebrews 13 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, listen, church, equip you with all that is good to do His will. He has given you everything you need to fulfill that anointing, working in you what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. So I just want to take the pressure off praying and take the discipline out of it and turn it into delight because God answers prayers based on who he is, not on who we are. Can I get an amen? He answers prayer because of who he is. Because he is my shepherd. He is my provider. He's my peace. My healer. Oh, even when I'm a sinner, he's my righteousness. And even though I don't deserve it, he's my constant companion. And even when I don't even know there's a fight, he's my defender. And he has set me apart so the world can know that he's real and that he loves them too. And he has set you apart and sanctified you as well. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Those of you joining on live stream, would you join with us right now? In a moment, A realistic assessment. Do you truly, truly know that 
Jesus is your personal shepherd. He's there. He's mine. I've surrendered my life to him. I've trusted him. But if not, right now, right here, in this room and at home, wherever you're watching, you can invite Jesus to do what he came to do, to be your shepherd, to be your savior. So how do I do that? Just, just call upon him. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I surrender my life. I ask for your forgiveness. Let's just pray right now. Just pray with me. Just tell Jesus, dear Jesus, I believe that you're God. I believe you loved us so much that you left heaven, came to this earth, and died and took my place on the cross. And because of that, Jesus, today, I ask for forgiveness. I ask you for your presence in my life from this day forward. Be my shepherd. Jesus, be my pastor. Lead me, guide me, feed me, protect me. Lord, I know you're going to answer this prayer because of who you are, not because of who I am. And Lord, teach us to trust you enough to pray based on who you are, not on who we are. Thank you for being the God that does all the things that we so desperately need. Lord, we renew our desire to live a life separated for you alone. In Jesus' holy name we pray. If you pray with me, just say amen right now. Amen. And now listen, there's, we know there's some people right there. And they invited Christ into their life, made the most important decision of their life, and Satan can't ever take that away from them. Amen? Amen. So let's give them a round of applause. Amen. Great decision. Great decision. And we would love uh, to send you information on the next steps. So if you would just fill out that connection card, if you're physically here online, you can fill one out right there online underneath those tabs underneath the video. And, and we're not going to show up at your door unannounced. Um, unless you live on a beach in Florida, we might show up unannounced there. Uh, but uh, we just want to send you, what should I do now? Now that I know Jesus, what, what should I do now? We just want to send you some information on that. Uh, church, you're doing an awesome job. Uh, September is here, and uh, short sleeves are about to disappear, aren't they? Yeah, how, about, how, how many start looking at your sweaters the other Oh, yeah. Like, it's going to be cold in church. I better wear a sweater. And uh, we're getting the sweaters out. Fall is here. And make plans to come to the Fall Festival. It's going to be a great time of food and fellowship. And the kids are going to have, bring your grandkids. You say, oh, can I bring my neighbor's kids? Please. Bring your coworkers. Invite them out. Say, hey, we're throwing a party. And say, where? Uh, on Telegraph, it's, it's this place. Don't tell them it's a church. Just tell them it's a place. It's this place. And the food's going to be great, and the games are going to be fun, and the music, and, and I mean, we just, we, last year I had so much fun, I lost all my hair. And that, that's how much fun we have at, fall, at our fall harvest party, so don't forget to register so we have enough uh, food and, and fun to go around. And thank you for your, your giving. Uh, you're, you're being so faithful, and uh, you're blessing my heart. And you're touching people all around the world uh, with your faithfulness. I just want you to know that we are in connection, uh, in contact with Hope of Life, trying to figure out what to do this Christmas. We had fun last Christmas, didn't we? Uh, with, with a benefit night and, and all that. We just shocked them last year. And so they're letting us know what their needs are, and we're going to respond to those needs because they're really not accepting teams uh, on site yet and so our, our, our financial resources and so they have needs they're gonna let us know and, and we'll let you know and, and we'll, we'll do that at Christmas time so start preparing for that but get your tithes and offerings ready those of you watching online you can get by text on, on your phone you can go online or you can mail it in if you're here you can use the envelope right in front but thank you for your faithfulness let's pray and let's stand 
Come on, let's everybody stand. Let's pray and ask God to bless this offering. Father God, thank you that you hear us right now based upon who you are. And Lord, you have provided for us. You're our shepherd. You have taken care of us in the presence of our enemies. You guide us and direct us. You've set us apart for you. And Lord, we give these offerings because you have healed us forever spiritually through salvation. So Lord, bless this offering. May it touch other people's lives in a meaningful way so they can know you as shepherd too. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen. Let's sing together.